Next thing we need to do is we need to be able to boot into Linux to build Linux. So that's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. How do we do that? Well, what we can do is we can boot this machine from a live CD or live DVD or live USB drive. And if you've never encountered a, a live uh, CD, basically what it is, it's, it's a CD or a DVD or a USB which you can plug into the, the computer and you boot from it. So instead of booting from Windows, you boot from the DVD or the USB stick and it allows you to try out Linux without making any changes to your PC. And because of that, we can use that as a, a host to create Linux from scratch. So we won't make any changes to the machine apart from changes we do to build Linux from scratch. Now there's two things we need. We need a live image, live Linux image, and we need a method of writing that image to the CD or DVD or the USB. So to do that we need to go to the web and download some files to get this to work. So the first thing we need to do is to select a uh, an image that we can boot from. Now um, the method I'm going to show you to build Linux from scratch deviates from the book slightly but only because I believe it's a method which would allow you to build Linux from scratch regardless of which flavor or distribution of um, Linux you choose as a host to um, boot from as a live image. Um, I've found building Linux from scratch over the years that depending on what distribution you use sometimes in fact most of the time you need to install extra packages or tweak the system in some way to um, allow you to have a host that's fully compatible with building a Linux from scratch operating system so I'm going to um, take a risk here and say you can use whatever distribution you want. So if you're happy using Fedora or if you're happy using Ubuntu or Mint or whichever one, you go ahead and use that one. Um, I'm pretty sure if you follow my method of installing Linux from scratch, you won't have to install any other um, packages or images or do any tweaks for the live image that you choose to boot from. I'm going to try De Debian. I've never used it before. Um, I'm decided I'm going to use something a little bit different. So it's a bit of a poke in the dark for me. I've never used it. I don't know what it's going to be like, but um, I'll try it and uh, see how we go with it. So if you want to follow this along, um, let's say if, you've, if you're a bit unsure about things or you've never done a lot of this sort of stuff before, follow along, do exactly what I do. Don't deviate from what I do or what the book tells you to do and I can guarantee you will have a, a working um, Linux from scratch system at the end of this. So let's uh, put in Debian and you can see straight away we've got a link to CD, USB, ISO images. ISO is just a type of image, the structure of the image so we'll click on that and we need to find out which of these links we need. So, so it's telling us what options we've got. So download them via HTTP, so it's basically the web. You can buy media, you can download the images of something called Jigdo. I don't know what that is. Okay, so that looks like that might be Debian's own way of downloading. You can get it via BitTorrent, that makes it take some time depending on how um, how active the images are. And okay, so this looks like this is the link we want. Download live images. We don't want to download this uh, or use this link because these are the actual installation images. We don't want to do that. We don't want to change anything on the disk other than what we do with Linux from scratch. We want to keep Windows intact so we can still use it after we've done the install um, but we want to only install our Linux from scratch that we build up. 
So um, we'll click on that link because that's the one that says we've got live images. And it tells you a bit about them, different flavors. So there's different desktop environments. And if you're not aware of what that is, that's just the sort of look and feel of the um, actual GUI that comes up. So at the moment we're in Windows and obviously it's got the look and feel of Windows. But in Linux, you can have you have choices about what what um, the desktop looks like. They can be quite basic and they can also be quite advanced. Architecture that obviously that depends on what machine you've got. If you've got a machine that's um, probably definitely five years old, up to five years old or so, it definitely will be an AMD 64 bit. Um, even if it's an Intel machine, it will be AMD 64 compatible. Um, I'd possibly say if it's 10 years old, it, it will be 64 bit compatible, but you might need to double check just to make sure it's not a 32 bit machine. Certainly if it's um, a lot of the notepads when they first come out, the little um, sort of uh, Asus EEE notepad things, they were 32 bit initially, but they did turn into 64 bit. But that's worth checking out to make sure if it's anything older, it probably is a 32 bit machine. Um, and it will take a lot longer to build as well because it obviously will be slower as well. Um, so yeah, it says the size is smaller than set of full set of DVD images. I believe the full set of images to install Debian is, you know, five or six or more, something like that. So, um, but w because we're boot booting from a live DVD, it will just be, you know, the size of a CD or size of a DVD uh, and languages. So uh, let's have a look. Right. So what we want here is the DVD stroke USB image to get it the fastest. If you know how to use BitTorrent and you want to download it that way, it's probably better you do it that way and um, it's it's a bit more of a community way of doing things because you're sharing your bandwidth with everyone else. So it's just sharing it a little bit. But um, for the, these purposes, I'm going to download it directly just so, um, just so it doesn't take too long. So now it tells us what we've got in this directory. You can see there's some files at the bottom. It tells you how to use them, that they're ISO images, and we we'll need to write them to media, either a writable DVD or a USB stick. So it looks like these aren't small enough to fit on a CD, but a DVD or a USB should suffice. And it tells us to do a checksum on the images. Now in Windows, there's no way of doing that by default, but we've got a link here showing us how to verify them, whether it says to how to do them on Windows, no it doesn't. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it does, it's a bit unfortunate. But basically what we need to do is download one of these images. Now at the top we've got the checksums in various different formats, so it's the M MD5 signatures SHA1, 256 and 512 signatures. Um, so we can ignore them for the time being. And then what we've got is we've got groups of the uh, images depending on what which desktop we want to use, which environment. So there's a Cinnamon one, there's one called GNOME, KDE, LXDE and so on. I'm going to use the KDE one because that's what I'm used to. Um, obviously, if you've got a preference, you can choose that. But if you just want to follow along, then choose the KDE one like I do. So I'm going to click on that link and I'm going to save it to the disk. You can see it's two and a half gigabytes, so it might take a few minutes to download. So while that's downloading, we need a program that can write this image. Now I'm going to write my image to a USB stick. Um, I think, I'm not totally sure, but I think if you're writing to a DVD, I think... I'm not sure, you might need to check this, but I think Windows can write an ISO image directly, but I would check that. Otherwise, just follow the method that I'm using, which is to download a third party um, tool to write the image. So I'm going to open a new tab, I'm going to let that uh, image download in the background. Uh, where is it there? So yeah, it's, it's downloading okay. And I'm going to use a tool called 
Rufus. In fact, I'm going to download two tools, but it will be Rufus that I use to write the image. And it's this top link here, Rufus.ie. This is the tool we want. Create bootable USB drives the easy way. So just scroll down. And if we click on, I believe this portable one is one where you can just run it without having to install it. So I'm going to use that save that one and while that's downloading I'm going to download another tool called raw Write, which is one that I used to use to write ISO images in Windows but I found it has a bit of a problem if you've already got something on the USB stick there doesn't seem to be any way to erase the USB stick and if there's something on the USB stick it it seems to have a bit of a problem so I stopped using it since when I found Rufus but one thing it has got which is very useful is it gives us the signature of the ISO that we download which is quite important because we can verify that against the signatures that uh, have been given at the top of the screen here so let's see what is downloaded okay so the ISO is still downloaded, so let's install these two files. In fact, like I say, I think this one's a standalone. Oops. Let's just run that and see if it does run. Uh, not bother about that because I'll be using it again on here. Yeah, that looks like that is a standalone. I didn't need to install that. Um, but obviously, if you want to install it into the system, then you can select the other download. And this one does need to be set up. Raw right. So let's get that installed. That's quick. Okay, so I'm just running this raw right. You can see it's quite a basic tool. It just takes an image, and what will happen when we open the image is it will verify the signature for the image and display. That, well, in fact, it displays several signatures, so we can verify that the download is successful. We don't want to do a big download and find that there's a little hiccup on the line. And um, although Windows says it downloaded okay, it's it's actually a corrupt image. It's the last thing we want to come across. So when this is finished downloading, so it's going to be a few minutes left. So. We'll just wait for that to uh, finish downloading. Okay, so that's finished downloading. So what we can do now is if we go to the um, disk image tool, the raw right one, and open that image. Um, we'll have to select all files to make it visible because ISO, the ISO is not one of the default um, options. So that's the one we want there. Open it and you'll see what it does immediately is calculate the signatures for the um, ISO file that we've just downloaded and it's creating the signatures for several um, so it doesn't matter which one we validate really, but we can do the top one, MD5 sums, it's the shortest one, so it's the easiest one to look at. Um, you can see we need to find out the one I downloaded, which was that one there, KDE. So it begins 7232 and ends in 494D, so let's just check that. There it is, there, 7232, 494D and obviously you can check the whole lot of that but it looks like it's okay so that that shows that we've got a a good image that we've downloaded as i say i used to use this to write to um, write the iso in, images but i have had a few problems with it in the future so i don't tend to use it anymore but it's useful for this validation within windows so i'm going to shut that down now and go back to rufus now i know we've got a a good um, ISO image that we downloaded.
get rid of that. And what we need to do here is select a, sorry, click on here to select the ISO. So this has found it straight away. Click open. And it's loaded it there. Now I need to plug in my um, USB stick. So I've got USB stick. It's actually already, already blank. So I think the other one would have worked. But I wanted to demonstrate this one. So if I plug that in now, you can see the rest of the uh, options comes up. It's the device I've got, no labels, 16 gigabyte. USB disk. Um, I imagine being this is only two and a half gigabyte, you could uh, get away with a four gigabyte U USB disk as the smallest. Um, but I've not tested on that, so I don't know. Certainly with an eight gigabyte, it would, it would work. <clears throat> um, just check these. You want to leave this as MBR. In fact, to be quite honest, I don't think any of these make any difference because when we start to write it, it gives us two options um, of how it's going to write to the to the USB drive. Um, these only pertain to a method it uses where it extracts the files from the ISO, the file that we just downloaded, and it rebuilds um, a bootable image uh, with the FAT32 file system. Now, it's not a problem, but it's not the original file that we downloaded um, and I'm always slightly wary of whether there's anything in that ISO that the live image may need that this uh, tool doesn't extract or, or leaves out so what we should do is if, if you like there's a log here you can bring up to show show what's happening when you do the I'll click start to show you um, oh yes, when you run this for the first time, it needs to download a few files. So just do yes to that. They're only small files. It didn't take too long. Yeah, this is the bit here where it gives you two options on how it's going to write it. If you select the ISO image mode, it's not the original image that gets written. What you'll see in the log is you'll see it extracting files from the ISO and then it rebuilds its own image. And so I'm not really not really too happy with that because I don't know what it's leaving out that's in the original image. If you select the DD mode, this is the better one because it will just copy bit for bit the, the data that's in the ISO image and dump it onto the USB image. And this DD image mode, as it calls it, that's the method that we would use in Linux um, because there's a tool called DD which you use to, to write images. So this would be my preferred method of write, writing this image to the USB drive. So if I click OK, uh, it gives you a warning to say that everything on the device will be destroyed. So just check it's the right one. It's given it a label, uh, a let drive letter, but it's neither here nor there because when it's finished writing it, it won't be visible in Windows. Um, so you can check it to make sure that it's the right one by the size of it. So 16 gig. I know for a fact there's no 16 gigabyte hard drives in this PC. I've got a 16 bit, uh, 16 gigabit USB stick plugged in, so it's got to be the right device. Just make sure it's not your C drive. <laughs> That's all I can say, or a D drive or something. Uh, just make sure it's identified the right device. So I click OK here. See, the first thing it does is delete partitions, and then all you'll see with this DD mode, it says writing image while it copies that image to the USB drive. If you'd used the other format, you'd see a load of files whizzing past. Um, but as I say, I wouldn't recommend that. It will work, but I wouldn't re recommend it. So we'll just wait um, a minute or so for this to write the data to the USB. Okay, so that's now finished. Um, as I say, we can't actually view or check anything because that's a proper see there's on the USB devices there's nothing there it, it doesn't recognize it because it's a proper um, Linux formatted device now so that's why it's not visible um, we might be able to see it in device manager possibly sorry disk management 
yeah, we can see it's got an EFI boot partition, a bit like our main disk. Um, and it thinks the rest of the disk is unallocated. So it's, it can see there's a 3 meg EFI partition. The reason it can see that is because EFI partitions are formatted to FAT32, which is a Windows format. Um, and it thinks the rest of the USB stick is unformatted because it just doesn't recognize it. So uh, that looks like that's worked okay. What we need to do now is to reboot into the USB we've just written. Um, there is one caveat here. Um, some with the UEFI UEFI boot, there's something also called a secure boot, which is turned on by default because Windows um, will boot with secure boot. It's got the right certificates installed in the in the machine to allow it to boot um, uh, the, the reason for this is to stop anybody just plugging in an operating system and rebooting and getting getting access to files on the on the PC um, and the problem is that a lot of Linux distributions don't have these certificates or aren't compatible um, so we'll probably have to turn off the secure boot in the BIOS. So um, what I should do first of all is just try this to see if it will boot and to boot from the USB if you've never done this before you'll have to find out um, what button you need to press when the machine is booting to get a boot menu up. Um, it's usually F8 or F12. On this machine it's F12 if there is no such button then what you have to do is go into your BIOS which is usually F2 or the delete button and modify the order of the booting um, of the devices that boot but I can show you that um, what I'm going to do initially is just restart this machine and oh, oh, McAfee is installing your updates that's not very helpful now is it uh, I'll just do restart anyway I'm going to hold down my F12 uh, button to get the boot menu up. And I'm just going to try and boot from this um, USB stick to see if it will boot. It probably won't. Um, we'll just, just see what happens. It'll either come up with a message saying, you know, I can't boot from this and it will boot from Windows or um, you know, something else might happen. I don't know. So you can see uh, the UEFI boot. There's several options here. That's the USB stick I've got plugged in, the sand disk. So I'm going to try and boot from that. Let's see what happens. Oh, it has actually worked. Okay. So obviously the Debian somehow has managed to boot successfully. So what I'm going to do now is go into the BIOS menu to show you two things actually. Um, how to disable the secure boot which if your Linux installation won't boot um, you'll definitely need to do um, you'd need to do it anyway because Linux from scratch won't boot when we come to boot it so this is the um, configuration for the PC I'm on you can see there's an option called secure boot and secure boot enable and you can see it's currently enabled so we need to disable this and it says it reduces system security. Are you sure? Yes. And just apply that. And save it. Now, as I say, if you haven't got a button which brings up a boot menu for you when the machine is starting up, you need to change the boot sequence. And you can see on this system, there's an actual menu. Um, I'm not sure how this one works, actually, because I've never used it. But generally what happens is you can modify the order of the devices that the machine can boot from so you need the USB drive that you've got plugged in so that it can see it you can see it's at the bottom here so it will it will try and boot I wonder if this is probably the bit where you modify the order yeah it is so I've highlighted the one that I want to move and I've used the arrows to move it to the top so that's the first one that will get boot, booted 
as I have got a boot menu, I'm not going to bother changing that. Um, but you will need to change that and save it. So I'm just going to exit from that now. I want to save changes now. I don't want to save the changes I've just made, so I'm going to do no. I'm actually going to go back in and double check. Those settings. Let's make sure the secure boot is still off. Right, it is, okay. So it's just asking me about the changes I've made on that boot sequence menu. So although the secure option is off, Windows should still boot as it was before. You shouldn't notice any difference. It just enables us to boot other operating systems that haven't got the security signatures uh, built into them. And as you can see, there's the Windows logo appeared. It's booting OK. And there's the log on the screen. So, as I say, there's, there's no problem with doing this.